Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. At least I am for this week. As of next week, my successor, Martina Garcia, will take over. She comes to us from the, uh, the London Stock Exchange. So I guess that she has a particular interest in this subject, and we will no doubt be following it up in the future under her uh, suzerainty or leadership or whatever is the word. But uh, the public markets, um, there are problems with the public markets, there are problems uh, accessing the public markets, there are problems of encouraging listings on the public markets, and I'm delighted that we've put together an immensely eminent panel to, to discuss both the problem and potential solutions. Our kickoff speaker is John Plender. John is, as oh, I'm sure all of you know, a columnist and senior editorial writer at the Financial Times. Uh, he's also a former, uh, what, a former uh, chairman of um, a listed company, um, Quintain. He's a former chairman of Perk. Uh, he has written extensively on a whole range of issues. His most recent book, Capitalism, Money, Morals, and Markets. Uh, and of course, he started as a chartered accountant with Deloitte and Plender, but he doesn't get things all his own way. Our next speaker is Angela Knight. Angela is a former city minister, but I first came across Angela when she was the chief executive of Atkins, the Association of Private Client Investment Managers and Stockbrokers. Since then, she has been the chief, the chief executive of the uh, uh, BBA. She's been the chief executive of Energy UK. She is has been the former the chairman of the office of tax uh, tax simplification which is i suppose an oxymoron and she's currently the chair, chairman or chair i'm never quite sure of pool re uh, but after her equally eminent is adam farkas adam farkas is the chief executive of AFNI, the association of financial markets in europe where he has been for the last couple of years he's the former executive director of the paris based eda eba the european bank Association, one of the three ESAs. Before that, he was a managing director and board member at the National Bank of Hungary. And Nandini Sukumar, Nandini, whom I've known for a very long time, almost as long as the CSFI has been going, uh, was, is the chief executive of the, world, of the World Federation of Exchanges here in London, where she's been for eight years. She was previously a correspondent on market structures at Bloomberg. And if there are any holes left to fill, we have Jonathan Haynes from Oxira. He's a senior consultant there. He was formerly at the European Commission, formerly at the UK's government's economic service, and before that at HM Treasury. So that's a powerful panel to discuss which I, what I think is a, a really genuine problem. First of all, let me ask John, John Plender, to, to kick off and give us, as it were, a synoptic view of what's going on here. John. Okay, well, thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everybody. Um, I think we can probably all agree that there has been a, a relative decline in public markets relative to private markets over the past 20 or 30 years. Um, just to put a number on that, the OECD estimates that since 2005, more than 30,000 companies have delisted globally from stock markets, especially in the US and Europe, and that has not been matched by new list listings. So there's a, a net loss of listed companies in the OECD every year from 2008 to 2019. Now, if you look at the US, where the phenomenon I think is probably more marked than everywhere else, the number of private companies is lower than at any time in the past 40 years. So that's the, the thing that I'd like to concentrate on, on primarily. Now, there are a number of structural reasons why that change in the relative balance of power between public and private has come about. But I think it's worth emphasizing at the outset that our views on this should be colored to a large extent by what has happened to monetary policy since uh, the financial crisis. Uh, the fact is that we've had ultra loose monetary policy, extraordinarily low interest rates, and that has meant that super cheap finance has been available for buyouts and for M&A. And that has been a very powerful impetus behind uh, the tilt in the balance of power from public to private. And I think the overvaluation of equities as a result of ultra loose monetary policy has encouraged investors to increase their risk appetite and engage in a search to capture the illiquidity premium in private markets. 
On the structural changes in the economy that have affected this issue, um, obviously the institutionalization of investment, which has been a progressive feature really over uh, 40 to 50 years, um, that has uh, created huge pools of professionally managed money that uh, is, this is looking for diversification opportunities. So there have been huge inflows of that institutional money into private equity, which means that it's easier for innovative private companies to stay private. Um, and that has also been uh, encouraged by changes in regulation. But li the limitations, for example, in the US on the number of investors uh, you have in private companies has been increased since 19... 96 quite considerably so it's much easier to stay private on the basis of that uh, regulatory change and it's just worth uh, reminding you too that um, uh, one of the effects of this huge flow of institutional money into private equity is that dry powder in private equity is now measured in trillions <laughs> Um, worth mentioning, too, another structural change, which is the growth of the intangible economy. In the 1970s in the US, the average ratio of intangibles to book assets, net of cash, was 20%. There's been a five-fold increase since then. In the 2000s, it was 100%. Now, I think the significance of that shift in our economies towards intangibles is, first of all, that... Um, these companies that are predominantly uh, based on intangibles don't need IPOs for investment. Um, the only reason they engage in IPOs is that their backers need an exit um, and they need to have a currency for takeovers and to uh, give their employees equity. Um, some people argue that private equity is a better structure for these kind of risky intangible operational knowledge assets, which are very hard to value, um, not least because accountancy practice is not really caught up with the intangible economy. I think that the accountants are, are behind uh, and are not good at, at measuring intangible values in the balance sheet. Um, and there are some people who argue that young intangible based innovators are not well suited to public markets, which are short termists, um, and the quarterly earnings treadmill is unhelpful for these kind of companies. Um, having said that, I'm a little bit skeptical uh, on this argument that PE is a better natural home for them, because if you look at the quoted sector in the US, for example, uh, the number of small tech companies uh, that the, the, the public markets accommodate that are hugely loss-making is pretty remarkable. That is a, a, an astonishing kind of long-termism in a way. Um, I think the other, the other thing that's worth, worth mentioning in passing is that um, a lot of young, intangible, innovative companies are being taken out by big tech uh, in killer acquisitions that are intended to crush potential uh, competition. Um, a particular problem for these companies, too, relative to the more tangible based companies, is that an IPO requires disclosures that are potentially helpful to their competitors. And that is a deterrent for a lot of them um, in, in going uh, public. Now, if I could just turn to the um, one or two final points. I mean, I think um, that... <sighs> One of the advantages of staying private for these, these intangible companies is that the, the VC industry nowadays is highly knowledgeable, particularly in the US. Um, and it also uh, provides a solution to the agency problems that dog public markets with their dispersed ownership. Um, and I think also it's striking that the, the lack of good price discovery in, in private markets is becoming less of a problem because of the growth of trading platforms <laughs> in the private area. Um, one other point I will raise is that um, it's been very interesting that the OECD is worried that, that for-profit stock exchanges have been bad for small growth companies because stock exchanges want lots of trading in highly liquid big company shares. Uh, they don't have an interest in reducing IPO costs and or, of course, do investment banks. Well, finally, how do we revivify public markets if we think that that is a, a, a good thing, a, a necessary thing to do, which I certainly do? Well, I think um, monetary policy offers a natural corrective. Um, if uh, monetary policy is now to be tightened quite considerably, as appears likely 
given the, the rate of inflation and the fact that we are central banks are now coming round to the view that it is not uh, transitory as they thought six months ago. I think it means that, um, first of all, those private equity players who are simply financial engineers loading investee companies with debt and extracting huge dividends, um, they will be exposed. It will be harder to do that in the context of rising interest rates. Um, and generally, I think that uh, since private equity is more debt dependent than public equity, uh, a rising interest rate environment is going to be less helpful to private equity. I think that on my point about killer acquisitions, uh, and, and competition. Um, I think that uh, big tech is going to find itself subject to a much more rigorous competition policy environment. I think the competition policy makers in both the US and Europe are waking up and are going to be offering a tougher framework to big tech. And finally, I think that uh, institutional investors are going to discover that the illiquidity premium that they're trying to capture um, will have dwindle very considerably because of the weight of their own money going into private equity. I'm not convinced that there's much of an illiquidity premium left. So um, where does that leave us? Well, I think um, the balance will tilt a bit back towards public equity, but I don't think it will be a thoroughgoing reviv revivification. I think this debate will continue for a very long time. Okay, so what should be done? Uh, well, what I'm saying to you is that uh, I'm, I'm in favour of tougher competition policy, um, and I, th I think that then there are natural correctives. But beyond that, uh, I, it doesn't seem to me very likely that um, there is impetus within the system or within the policymaking fraternity to reduce the costs of IPOs uh, or for the, the, the investment bankers to offer a, 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 a more sort of... Uh, a, a, a lower cost approach to flotation. So the situation will correct itself automatically, but only partially. Correct. Right. And that you don't feel that there is anything that can be done by government or, uh, I guess, by pressure groups to, to accelerate that, uh, or what could be done by government? Well, I, I think that, uh, the tr that, well, what should be done by government, I suppose, if you think that small uh, tech companies are being disadvantaged um, it, by all this is that they should um, uh, try to, uh, you know, uh, ad address the costs of uh, IPOs and 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 make provide a more um, uh, useful regulatory environment. But it's not a problem which I think is pressing itself on uh, on policymakers or regulators. I mean, people. Uh, some... uh, the Hill and Khalifa reviews are enough in this area. You feel? You feel? Um, I, I'm afraid I, it's so long since I've I read them that I'm uh, I can't give you a good answer to that. Okay, Angela, what's what's your your thinking on this, both as a former policymaker and as a lobbyist, as it were? Well, can I start with uh, two apologies, if I may, Andrew? Uh, the first apology is that I'm sitting in the middle of a building site, which is called my home, uh, <laughs> and I have a uh, both noise going on all around me. Um, and I also have uh, um, an internet that uh, keeps on tripping in and out. So my first apology is that. And I suppose my second apology in uh, taking part in this debate is I agree with just about everything that John Fender has said. So I will, in some respects, add to his points uh, rather than sort of just go through them again. Um, I, I've been a long standing, as you know, great supporter of... Uh, UK institutions, the London Stock Exchange, London as an international uh, centre, London as being uh, well placed in all sorts of ways to be, you know, the, the greatest financial centre of which, in many respects, because of its iconic nature, the London Stock Exchange is a part. But at the same time, I think that there are some real issues that we've got, in fact, some other public markets got, but, but we've got. And so I'm going to constrain my remarks to how it looks and feels uh, in my role as a non-executive director, both of UK company that is listed and an American company that is listed. And then I'm just going to turn a few points around on what does it feel like if you are a customer of the London Stock Exchange? And of course, in many respects, you have to say the customer of the London Stock Exchange are the companies as well as the investors. 
because it is, uh, I remember that they absolutely hated me for saying it several years ago. I said, the London Stock Exchange is like a supermarket. It doesn't own the goods on the shelves and it doesn't own the customer. And that is exactly, uh, well, that is one way of describing it. Uh, I suspect they would hate it, me for it today, but that is where it is. So first of all, let me do that a very quick comparison between uh, being listed in the US and listed in the UK as far as a non-executive director of a company is concerned. I mean, the first is, is that the governance requirements, what you actually have to do uh, and be and swear to and sign off as a net of a UK company is much greater than that of a US company, very noticeably so. I appreciate that there's a greater degree in some respects of, of legalistics that sit around some of the things that you say, particularly um, your financial requirements the, uh, that are placed on US companies. But nevertheless, there's no, none of this senior management responsibilities. There is none of this actually picking on a non-executive director who chairs this committee or that committee, and particularly a remuneration committee. And um, as we know now, you know, voting them down if you don't like the remuneration proposals that they put forward. In fact, remuneration is a much lower key issue in the US than it is in the UK. It is perfectly acceptable if you're making a, a, a decent profit to pay your team uh, something, you know, your executive team, something that, you know, relates as well in the way of increases and packages um, than it is much more acceptable in the US than it is here. You do not have to, uh, as a US company uh, or a US executive, um, have your, your shares deferred for three years and then, you know, another three years you've got to hold before you can sell. So there's a whole series of those requirements that sit around the board, sit around the responsibilities of the NEDs, and sit around uh, executive remuneration that is in a different place in the US. I'm not necessarily going to use the word better, but I could, but it's in a different place in the US than it is in the UK. And indeed, we used to have a comply or explain regime in the UK. We now have an either you comply today or you comply comply tomorrow regime in the UK. And unsurprisingly, if you are on certain financial services companies in the UK, it is increasingly difficult to get uh, the choice of NEDs that you may wish. Because if your choice as an individual is to go on a financial services company, knowing that you have all these responsibilities sit around you, which is governance plus, compared with non-financial services, you know, you're saying, well, maybe I'll go on one of the others rather than our financial services. And then a, a step back again and say, US versus UK, it is notably lighter in the US than the UK. These governance regimes that sit around listed companies. So that is, that is one point. My second point is, is this. If you are um, one of the companies that's John mentioned, you know, you're a tech company, you're a young com company, you're a hungry company, you're one that isn't sort of sitting around with tangible assets, it's the new world, it's and all those sorts of things. And you are the founder, or you're one of the founders, you've built this thing, it's yours, you, you know, personally, because it's your company, your ideas, you built it, you've got it to year three, year four, year five, wherever it may be. And now you're looking around to say, I want something back. I want some, some money back. I need to pay some of my investors or whatever. And you look at listing and you look at the alternative, which is private equity, the chances are that you may decide on private equity. Because if you list, you've got to declare you know, a lot of information about your company, not just at the point that you list, but you've got to write your strategy every year. You're handing over much more information to the competitor. You've got to abide by rules of, you know, how much shareholding, I appreciate they've changed it now, but nevertheless, how much of the shareholding you've got to float, how much you can keep. You, you know, got different rules on you as the owner and your voting rights. And then you've got, as I say, a whole governance thing going around. So I do think that we have created a regime which may look very good as far as transparency is concerned. I've got absolutely 
no doubt about that. As far as some investors, and particularly here the large investors, it fits with their increasing competition between themselves about who can put out more and more requirements to listed companies. And I think that that is one piece of competition that I could do without. But from the perspective of the uh, attracting people to the regime that you have created, I think that we set up perhaps some hurdles that are too high. The AIM market has does do a very good job. And interestingly, when one looks back, that AIM market was designed for small companies. We've got some large companies on AIM. Ask them why they're on AIM, and they will all privately give you the answer that I've broadly outlined. So if we are going to say public markets are going to be more for companies of different sides, be more attractive in the future, then we don't we shouldn't just look at it from the perspective of this increasing requirement of governance and transparency and whatnot. However important that may be, there is a balance to be struck between what is attractive and what is of detriment to. And if we've, we've, we've put the balance of requirements too much on one side, in this side, what investors or the groups acting for investors are saying, then we're going to switch off supply. What good is that going to do to anybody? So as I say, I agree with all those comments that John has made about easy, easy money and all the rest of it. And I'm just adding to what he's saying. And I'm saying this is the time to think it through from more than one direction. I imagine that he might disagree with a couple of things that you've said in there. And I just want to give John the chance quickly, very quickly, to, to say whether, in general, you, you share Angela's concerns. <laughs> Dare well, he agrees with me. <laughs> um, well, I think Angela is is right that um, you know the, the the disclosure requirements and the degree of regulation on public markets is a definite deterrent to a lot of companies to 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 list. Mm. And and she's quite right too that AIM offers a much more um, hospitable home for a, a lot of these companies, uh, some of which have grown very big on. Aim. Um, and uh, as somebody who's uh, you know, sat on a quoted company board and, and chaired a quoted company, I can tell you that the endless round of meetings with your institutional investors take up a phenomenal amount of time. Um, and uh, you, you can see that there are great attractions in not being under the constant glare that the public markets impose on you. Um, having, having said that, um, I, I think that uh, Public markets do do offer a, a public good, um, and the, a lot of this disclosure is is very helpful in terms of the way we look at the, the way the economy is run. Um, and I think the price dis discovery is very valuable, and the public markets provide that to a far greater extent than the private ones do. But I think one has to be realistic and recognise that you know what is the incentive to go public at the moment, and it is true that the incentive in uh, the UK is um, there is a rather greater deterrent than there is in the US. Okay, Adam, Adam Farkas, what's um, your your view on this? Um... Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I will. Um, I, I, I completely agree with the with with, with the with, with the notion uh, and and the challenges painted by by John. And I completely agree with Anjana's point that that public markets essentially are are there to satisfy investors and issuers as clients, and and they don't own these uh, th these clients or, or or issuers. So what we I, I think what we what we need to look at is how the attractiveness of public markets can be increased. I will try to limit my remarks to structural issues. So I will not I will not talk about sort of monetary policy or the economic cycles and how how the the management of cycles. Um, impact the the relative valuations of private and, and public markets or the relative attractiveness of, of, of private and public markets um I, I agree with uh with with the observations of of john but i will not go into in, in, into that that sort of uh, macroeconomic policy uh space i would also try to avoid going into competition policy um uh issues that because that's that, that that's also a very interesting debate we could have a separate session on that so what i will try to focus on is um structural issues but what can 
make public markets more uh, more attractive. And this this is a debate which uh, which is is going on right now in in the UK uh, in the context of the of the of the of the Lord Hare review, the wholesale market review, the listing uh, the uh, the prospectus um, uh, uh, review uh, or prospectus uh, regulation review. Uh, and also, the same debate is going on on the continent um, uh, in the context of the the Mifid Mifir review and 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 the upcoming investor protection uh, issues, which will uh, which will again have another wave of, um, of of a regulatory review. So I think it it is it is a it is a live debate, and there are there are lots of things that are being considered in the context of of these reviews. And let me let me make a few points, which would I think could address some of the observations that, 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 that were made by John and, and Angela in the context of, of these reviews. First of all, the free throat requirements. Um, clearly, um, the, the requirements to have a, a certain level of free flow uh, is designed to ensure sufficient liquidity and the advantage of public markets uh, in providing liquidity and transparent price formation. Um, the, but, but clearly, this is a requirement which is uh, which is contrary to um, to the attractiveness of um, of private markets where such a requirement is not uh, is, is is not present. So I think, in terms of uh, increasing increasing the uh, the attractiveness of public markets. Uh, some of these free float requirements could be reduced uh, from from the current levels in the in in, in the UK without jeopardizing uh, the the objective of uh, of having sufficient liquidity uh, transparently um, uh, visible in public markets. We would also be uh, supportive of actually encouraging the FCA to use its 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 powers, uh, which we, and discretion, which would. On a case by case basis, could flow to could um, could waive um, uh, these requirements in in in, in certain uh, in certain cases uh, on on a where justified uh, basis. The second point, I think, of of, of structural issues, which um, a, again in the context of innovative companies, Angela mentioned uh, very vividly how some of the uh, so, some of the firms who were built up by. Uh, by, by a family, by a single individual, or or or, or some partners, are are, are very uh, are finding it very difficult to go um, and 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 list publicly. The the dual class share structures uh, are are providing an answer um, an answer to this. Of course, again, uh, limiting uh, dual class share, share structures it does have a public policy purpose. But allowing them would allow a more diverse set of companies uh, to list, um, and also uh, would make uh, private uh, uh, public markets more attractive as opposed to private markets where these these share structures and different classes of, of shares are completely feasible because they are just contractual uh, contractual features. So in our in in, in our view, uh, this um, a sort of measured and careful. Um, um, uh, relaxation of of uh, of the limitations on on on, on dual class shares uh, could 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 increase attractiveness. The third topic, where I think a very interesting debate is, and and I think the jury is still out, and the, and the debate is ongoing where where, where structural changes could uh, could take place, is the specs um, the specs market uh, again, which is a kind of public response to. To, to, to in a sense private equity uh, because it is it is allowing companies to list and 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 raise capital for the purpose of acquiring um, private companies um, in, 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 in in a broader sense but currently in the UK the requirements that that are the general requirements that that, that are applied to SPACs are not making it a very attractive uh, place to, uh, to to list these companies and I would mention um, I would mention two things uh, which could be considered in in this context one is that there is an assumption or an expectation of of, of, of um, um, suspending the trading of a SPAC when there is an acquisition uh, being made. And the, another one is the disclosure and information requirements, which would, um, which are designed for, um, let's say, non-SPACs or, 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 let's say, traditional uh, listed companies, but they are not really fit for purpose for uh, for SPACs. 
So I think some some special rules could be designed as to what information and in what format and in what fashion um, would need to be disclosed uh, in the case of a of, of a spec uh, issuer. Other things which are are being considered, and I will I will try to uh, quickly go through um, a, a few points. Um, in the context of the of the regulatory review, is the share trading obligation, where I think the um, the UK is, is is clearly moving to the right direction of removing this this obligation, i.e., making it completely free for investors to decide where where they want to execute their uh, their trades, uh, where, where they want to channel their uh, their uh, demand and supply. Um, again, we are fully um, in agreement with that. Uh, we think that market outages are an issue for for public markets. Um, we would very strongly welcome some more, um, a, a little bit of uh, top down or policy help in um, in actually having frameworks in place uh, to handle market outages. Uh, they happened across the continent in the UK and and the continent uh, in 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 the last few years. And it would be really good to uh, to have a system um, or have arrangements in place, which, in case of an outage, um, allows liquidity to uh, to quickly shift um, uh, somewhere else and and allow the continuation of trading, which again would make it uh, make it more more attractive for uh, for investors as well as issuers. Uh, in terms of market structure issues, there are small <laughs> small tweaks which do have significance, uh, which could be uh, reconsidered. Uh, the double volume cap. Um, it, it, we, we remember this is a this is a feature of EU EU regulation. We think that this uh, this would need to be re- removed um, um, uh, from uh, from all equities. Um, there is there are tick size regime regulations which uh, which um, currently prevent uh, bilateral trades to be executed at, at at midpoint. This is not the case in the US, so it's just undue limitations on what investors uh, can do uh, and where they can uh, they can uh, channel the liquidity. And also um, there is uh, there is a I think we think and investment banks our members think that there is a need for the recognition of um, of SIs, systemic internalizers. Um, who are clearly their their role is is that they are they are lending their balance sheets uh, and increasing liquidity, um, and with the appropriately designed uh, disclosure requirements, um, the, these uh, the, 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 this segment of the market or this execution mechanism could play a, a, a very um, positive role in uh, enhancing liquidity and that, and the attractiveness of public markets as well. So it's it's really to have a diverse ecosystem of of trading and execution mechanisms that would we think would make um, equity markets both primary and 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 secondary uh, more. Uh, more attractive. So I, I will conclude here. Would be happy to go into some of the details, but but I think some of some of the um, let's say market structure measures uh, could significantly add to the uh, to the attractiveness of, of of markets and address some of the issues John and, and Angela rightly pointed out. I'll and do you think here. do you think that the UK government is on track to to take your advice on this? Um, yes, um, by and large, yes. I think the we see that the the, the Hill review, the prospectus um, um, regulation, uh, the review of the prospectuses, and the and the wholesale market review have raised the right questions. And I think the um, th- there is a, there is a clear uh, indication that that the uh, that that these points or the the points of the industry, including the buy side as as well. Um, is 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 being um, are, are being are being are being considered and and hopefully it will be put into in, into legislation um, very soon. Okay. Again, can I ask John whether you accept the specific recommendations, the free float, uh, the listing of SPACs requirement, and so on? I feel very ambivalent about that. Um, and there's been a sort of long running argument over the years about whether a, a really tightly regulated uh, stock stock market uh, is more likely to attract uh, more and better quality listings, or whether a, a very loose regulatory regime um, will attract more and better listings. And 
Um, in some circumstances, for example, Brazil, when it set up its Novo Mercado with higher uh, corporate governance standards, it did indeed attract some uh, high quality listings relative to the main market. On the other hand, um, in the UK, I'm not sure that that has actually applied. Um, but uh, I do slightly worry that if we if we lower our standards, then um, we will see higher levels of, of, of abuse. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, on the issue of, for example, dual voting structures, um, I used to be a one, one share, one vote person. Um, but nowadays, it seems to me that, that it, back to the point about the intangible economy, the fact is that investors no longer bring so much to the party relative to, to the human capital uh, element in, in high-tech companies. Um, so I think that uh, there, is a, there is some sort of logic and justice in allowing entrepreneurs to have a greater voting power than these outside shareholders, many of whom are just passive profession professionals. Um, so uh, I've changed my view on that. But um, in general, I'm, I'm not entirely, well, I'm slightly worried uh, with some of Adam's points because uh, I do think that uh, a well-regulated stock market, a more tightly regulated stock market ought to attract uh, more and better listings. But as I said, I, I have to acknowledge that there, are weak, that there are shortcomings in my argument there. <laughs> the best may be the enemy of the good or whichever way around it is. Nandini, Nandini Sukuma, how you're, you're thinking on this. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be here on the session today because having listened to some of the comments and listened to some of the arguments, I find myself uh, obviously in agreement with many and not with others. What is striking to me really coming into this conversation at this point um, is uh, everyone seems to, to step away from the fact that the solution um, is to tilt the incentive structure better. So we, we spend a lot of time, I think, uh, thinking and talking about public markets. And I'm happy that, you know, I'm, I'm pleased, uh, Anthony, that you, uh, that you set off with by going in on the incentive or on private versus public, because I think that is probably where we need to be looking and thinking about this debate rather than a, a purer, you know, what can we do in terms of, you know, making public markets more attractive. If you look at where we are, um, at the start of the year, it's been a, it's a really interesting moment because broadly speaking, over the last decade, and I mean I'm very much in agreement with most of John's points uh, around uh, about the way that markets have public markets listings have evolved, you know, over the last 15 years. But if you look at what has happened, and let me give you a quick snapshot. I'm looking um, at the WFE's. Uh, numbers for uh, 2021 that we will publish them shortly. Um, we've had the most number of listings uh, for the last five years. Um, 2021 was actually uh, a very interesting year for listings. So in the middle of the pandemic, uh, what we saw uh, immediately as a feature uh, starting in 2020 was that companies came forward to use public markets. So straight away, that suggested to us that there was something there that we should be unpicking further. So let's look, if we look around the world, and you know, to those of you who don't know WFE, our members are you know, across the world. So we represent 300 public markets, both exchange and CCP in every jurisdiction you've probably heard of. Um, so but the, the number of listed companies on our members markets you know, is 52,000 at the end of last year, you know, we have trillions, our members have trillions going through in terms of, you know, order book trading, but also in terms of uh, capital raising for billions. So really, I think that we have a, a, an excellent global perspective. Um, and what is most interesting and has been for us for some years is the difference in the way Asia Pacific behaves versus the UK, Europe, um, and the Americas. So Asia consistently, there has been increasing use of public markets and by increasing use, I mean with IPOs. So in Asia, which is a clearly a different, in a, in a different place uh, compared to both the Americas and um, Europe and the UK, you find that more companies 
have come to market and they have continued to IPO uh, over the last five years. So if you look at the start of the year, I mean, if you look at the end of last year, the number of IPOs increased 70, almost 75%. And each region, and we have three regions of the WFE, we have the Americas and we in include in the Americas, not just you know, uh, new, not just NASDAQ and NYSE and TMX, the, the Toronto markets, but also, you know, Central and Latin America. So you have big listing venues there, like B3 or the Brazilians, for example. So every in every region, um, IPOs uh, increased. And you looked at the end of last year, uh, the number of listed companies rose 6% versus the year before. Now, if it rose, um, and last year was kind of the maximum, really. We've seen a five-year peak in the number of IPOs. So we should probably be thinking and unpicking, and what that is what we are doing now. What was different? What has been different um, in the last two years? And the, obviously, the answer lies in the pandemic and perhaps some of the responses uh, to the pandemic uh, that have occurred. So if you look as well at the breakdown relative uh, to 2020, capital raised through IPOs rose 80, 81%, uh, looking at my numbers. And that was, it set a new record in every region. Um, the Americas, uh, APAC, and EMEA, and they were all in billions. Um, the record, a record number of IPOs, um, the Americas took 6.8% uh, of, um, and uh, the EMEA region um, was, was the least. So if you, if you look, more broadly, capital raised by already listed companies, it, it also, they also reached new heights. So if you have, you know, you have approximately 854 billion uh, US dollars globally. So thinking about this landscape, obviously companies are using markets, IPOs are coming to market. So why now versus the wider trend uh, of the last 20 years? And I think the answer lies somewhere in some of the things we've heard. One, there is, during the pandemic, public markets stayed open. So if you were a company, you could still come, you could list on, mar on markets and you could still fundraise. So you could raise, you know, you could you access public markets. So that clearly um, has been very helpful for companies, which suggests as well that there is recognition of the role of public markets. So if we take away from that, because for a long time, I think it's been fashionable to talk about, well, maybe, you know, if we talked more, if we understood better, if we promoted more the benefits of public markets, you would find a reversal in the trend that companies come to market. This suggests really to us that we're able, that we have been able to convey the benefit of public markets. So therefore the answer lies elsewhere. And I would say that answer lies, therefore, in the incentives that you give to companies to come to market. One of the things, I mean, I agreed with much of what John and Angela said. I mean, they talked about, you know, the very considerable um, incentives or the very considerable attractions of staying private and why that would be rather than coming to list on a public market. That's absolutely true. I mean, if you look as well uh, around what is required of companies coming to a public market, um, the incentives are completely stacked in the wrong direction. Um, government and all of us uh, should be calling for a, a recalibrated incentive structure where it is attractive to come to a public market. You don't just use the public market in a crisis, but public markets where you have standards of governance, where you have investor protection at the heart of the mandate, where you have a promotion you know, of democratic inclusive access, um, these are this this is the ultimate this is the ultimate you know public good if you like i won't say not not in, not relative to everything but they, it is a public good um and if you look at that uh, versus you know private markets where for sure there needs to be better governance i think better governance um in private markets would lead to a better to, to a greater a better standard overall in the entire ecosystem um that would be a start i think we need to see uh very effective incentives addressing some of those structural uh, frictions, if you like. We did a survey. We did a we did a paper a couple of years ago at the WFE where we spoke to family-run companies, uh, because for, for all of you, as all of you know, family-run companies um, 
are a, a, a large pipeline uh, of potential listings. So family and state-run enterprises are the two kind of primary sources. Uh, there they are, if they could come to public, you know, it's extreme to spend a lot of time uh, thinking uh, and speaking to them uh, to understand how best they can help them list. So when we did our paper on family-run enterprises and we titled it casually, how do you get family-run enterprises to list? Um, we found just as John and Angela said, um, that many of them uh, listed governance, you know, cost, uh, all those things, you know, unwelcome, unwelcome kind of intrusion. They feared con losing control uh, of, you know, their companies, etc. But they were all to do with governance largely. You know, cost tended to be smaller, a smaller proportion of their concern, but the cost in and of itself was linked to governance. Um, and this goes back, I think, uh, to something that uh, Angela and John said, which is, you know, if you public markets exist for a public good, there is a cost involved with using public markets. So instead of focusing on the cost, we should be focusing on the benefit, you know, and that can be changed. And that for that, we need incentives. It isn't, I mean, I don't agree with the OECD, which says that, you know, exchanges that are listed companies have no particular incentive um, to promote SMEs uh, come to market. If you look, and I live, I live with our members, and we look at the, the very considerable uh, work and the expenditure that goes in to supporting the SME pipeline, which is largely a sunk cost. Um, if you look at that, you would under, I mean, one understands really that exchanges spend a lot of time, uh, whether they're private or they're public, because listing is the future. If companies don't list, you know, none of us uh, on this panel would have anything to be talking about. I'm very and keen that we should we should get Jonathan in. So can you yes. can possibly wrap up? So the, the other point, and I want to conclude really by saying that the answer lies in the incentive structure, you know, private versus public. At the moment, the incentives are much more tilted in favor of public of private markets. Tilt them in favor of public markets, and we'll be in a good place. Okay, great. Let's let's Jonathan. What um, what's your view of the the entire debate that you've heard? Thank you very much, Andrew, for for inviting me. And uh, you know, incredible man has already been covered. It's quite a difficult job coming coming at the end. Um, and I think most of uh, my reflections come from um, some analysis we did for the commission. So as Adam Farkas was saying, um, th this is a live debate in, in many regions and the European policymakers are also looking at this. And we did quite a lot of analysis on covered all the points raised. And I think I agree with uh, nearly everything that, that's been discussed. Um, our our pre-COVID numbers on the listing gap was that there are 17,000 large unlisted companies in Europe that could be listed. And the UK was the region, the country with the largest gaps with 3,500. That was pre-COVID. And I know there was full of listings in 2021, but I think that the, the larger long-term trend is, is still there. That, that's my view. And I heard also in 2022, there's kind of a bit, of, a bit more subdued activity. In, in terms of what can be done, uh, oh, sorry, what's the problem, what's driving the problem? Clearly, yes, private equity is a key one. And m a are the two key factors that, that our analysis concluded was the key driver of this. And on, on the m a side, what's interesting is, you know, the, the textbook example in the, the 80s would be that a firm grows through an angel investor, a venture capital investor, and then eventually it has to go to the public market to, to grow and expand. And now what you see is actually the firm could go to the public market and then be acquired into the, the private market. And we, we saw in the data... Um, you know, companies being uh, acquired by large listed companies, but also companies being acquired by large uh, private uh, companies, and 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 in that flow stock and flow analysis, that 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 does support the reduction in the number of, of listed companies. Um, and then you know, there's there's obviously we've tried to focus in our thinking about what what I would call controllables from the policymaker perspective. So so less um, about the monetary policy. Um, dimension and also some of the things that, that are happening are very positive developments. The, the, the growth in private equity is, is a positive thing to, to embrace and bring good outcomes. Um, in terms of what, what can we done to support a lot of the things that have been discussed already, we spoke a lot with the FCA and the Hill Review to support their, their analysis. Um, I think all the changes around dual car shares, free float, market cap, 
um, and also one that's been mentioned, the track record requirements, also a helpful start. But I think as, as Lord Hill himself put it, that was about London closing the gap with other financial centres. And I think um, kind of also people recognise there needs to be a sort of broader, more holistic um, to view, view on that. I fully agree with the point that's just been made by uh, Nadidi about follow-on. I think one of the big successes last year was uh, and the big benefit for a public company or the public market is the ability to tap equity markets and raise capital. And, and that meant that you didn't have to have gov um, larger government support measures in place to allow companies to access working capital. They could just go, those public companies could tap the markets. And that is a big success story that I think it'd be good for more companies, private companies to be, to be aware of and, and to make more of that. Uh, in, in terms of what can be done that hasn't been discussed so far, I think one of the, the areas that hasn't been discussed so much is the retail participation, which is something where I think the UK and Europe is behind. Um, there are some good things going on in the UK at the moment around that. I know primary, primary bid, for example, are trying to support retail participation in the IPA process. And there's a solution that we were looking at in, the, in Australia, a company called On Market Book Build, that was trying to think about how to support retail market participation while also recognizing that it's the institutional investors in the IPA process that often drive that price summation. The other thing uh, which we kind of quite interested about is around, um, we talked a lot around the search costs, the information costs around being a public market, uh, a public um, company, but um, how can technology, how can the kind of often these markets evolve and, and solutions and entrepreneurs um, provide solutions to deal with these problems? And that is what we're seeing. Um, so there are some technology solutions that are in, in development and starting to work their way through the system around trying to make it easier for people to use information in a, in a cost-efficient way um, to address some of the, the concerns that, that have been raised. And then finally, uh, and I'll pause, uh, the interaction between tax system, uh, company law, and this thing, I think, is something else that hasn't yet been covered. So the tax, obviously, the debt, equity bias is really important. I think on the positive side in the UK, there's been a number of tax measures that have helped support investment and aim, for example, inheritance tax rules and that's some of the other things that the Treasury have done in the past. But clearly the debt equity bias is, is important. And on company law, something that we've noted across jurisdictions is when people are thinking about, and I think Angela talked a lot about remuneration, and if we look at things like disclosure on gender pay gaps and all these things are very important in terms of um, broader social um, uh, uh, policy and, and we're about to see the next wave of that with ESG requirements. Often those things are often um, applied on legislative, uh, listed companies in the legislative <laughs> process which, which does often tilt that balance. Often it's not intended at the beginning of the process but when you go through the full legislative process it often ends up applying to listed companies which I think is, is interesting to sort of sit back and reflect on. Well, I'm particularly interested on that because it does seem as though you know the, the trend is to make make listed companies even more um, forcibly responsive to government initiatives. And I don't know how Angela and, and Adam would think about that. Angela first. Yeah, well, thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> I think in that instance, uh, more is worse and less is better as far as uh, uh, additional governance and additional requirements. And that doesn't mean that I'm against uh, anything to do with ESG, which it clearly is a force for good, as is uh, publication of such things as the gender pay gap. But there is a, the, the, the way that the intention, which might have just been on the big companies, uh, has now walked its way down through the system. So everybody's having to do something and they have to do something, even if the rules don't say it, because the major investors or the governance groups are saying, you must do this or we're going to vote against, has added, unfortunately, a disincentive to new listings, and it certainly put some question marks as well in some of the mid-sized companies. Um, to my mind, one of the, uh, <clears throat> you know, there are a couple of things that have been said which are extremely useful, and we should try anyway. I mean, if we bundle up all those changes that um, uh, were mentioned by Adam, and we get those, uh, uh, those changes put in place, you know, that at least has removed some of the, the structural hiccups that, that are there. And then, you know, Nandini uh, made the, the comment about the um, whole area of um, uh, incentives uh, and the the family companies. Was that Nandini or was it you, Jonathan? I'm not entirely yeah, sure. Nandini, but yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. but <clears throat> that there are a lot more family companies who could come to the market and potential and aren't coming for various reasons. Address those reasons. And then if you've done the structural changes and you've picked up some of the, re the reasons, then package it. So you're not uh, presenting to uh, a company, a founder, a family, here's this list of technical things and then it's going to be all right. It's packaged in a way that makes sense to you as an individual, as an owner, that this uh, public market, with all the transparency issues that sit around it, actually, you know, the public good aspects of it are not a cost disincentive or a governance disincentive or a loss of reasonable control disincentive, but now have been altered and adjusted. So yet you can actively take part in that force for good rather than saying, no, there's a deterrent to me and I'm going elsewhere. For Adam, I mean, the, the whole issue of founders and, and family um, owned companies. I mean, I know the FT has, has, has run a number of things saying, well, maybe family com owned companies are quite a good thing. They provide stability over a longer time. Um, the issue of uh, incentives that Nandini brought up, your response on, on, on these various tied issues. Yeah, well, well the, the um, on, on the incentives, I, I think I, I think it, I, I, I totally agree that that incentives should be um, should be tilted, and I, I, I don't think we need to swing the pendulum to completely to the other side. It's more of a more of a scaling of of, of the incentives or balancing the incentives uh, much better between private and public markets. And regarding the um, regarding additional requirements in line with um, investor expectations or, or, or government policy or both. Um, I would have a let's say a less radical view than, than Angela and, uh, and 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 sort of no, I wouldn't say that that more um, is less. Uh, but what I would say is that these requirements should be proportionate. Um, see, the, clearly, they should be uh, they should be more measured and 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 and, and balanced uh, because because publicly listed companies uh, should play a leading role in 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 sort of delivering um, to the expectations of society as a whole, uh, investors more specifically, uh, the the asset managers uh, in in the area of ESG or diversity or any any other um, um, uh, issues that are that are of concern for the society, but they cannot be uh, made um, sort of disproportionately the, the scapegoat or the the the, the targets of uh, of of um, excessive burden in. In, in in that space so i think uh, disclosure requirements are very important public companies are subject to a lot more disclosure requirements um some some rules might be might be proportionate um some higher expectations uh, f f from the leading companies might be proportionate or 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 reasonable but but it, they should not be excessive so that would be my, my my sort of answer okay let me ask a final question to all of you if will we be having this discussion five years from now, Nandini, is is this an issue which is going to continue or will we see a resolution one way or the other? Nandini. We won't see a resolution unless we tackle the, the, we tackle the point around incentives. So if you, and, and just going back to um, Adam's last point, I mean, the requirements on, on, on public companies add up and we should really be seeking to address this in a holistic way. You know, so that private companies in the private market also, you know, have better corporate governance, because I think that would go a long way uh, towards one, improving the overall health of the system. And two, you would find that the, the, the disconnect between private and public markets is less. Jonathan, will we be having this debate? I think we'll having a, be having a similar but slightly different version of the debate in five years. And I think probably that depends on the, the other structural factors that uh, John so neatly articulated at the beginning. Um, but I think all of these policy discussions and, and changes that are happening are, are positive and are to be welcomed. Angela. Yes, I agree with, the, I agree with what's been said, actually. And the, the, the proportionate point, I think, is a very valid point, And it's something that really needs to get into the rules and get into, into the requirements. Um, we will be having a debate in five years' time. That debate, Andrew, will depend upon what it is that individuals, people who run companies, boards who run companies, have done. Uh, either there'll be changes which make them believe that coming on the public market is a better thing, a better route for them, or changes will have been made, but somehow they haven't 
and hit the spot. Never underestimate what people do because it is how they feel and what they think is in their best interest will, which will govern their act and will govern our, our, it, our debate. It is not axiomatic that the public markets will be the preferred route five years from now. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, so I think we will have this debate in five years, maybe slightly on, on, on slightly different topics, but I think it's, um, I, I just don't see that the trend will live reverse um, sort of imminently. John, the final word is with you. Do you feel the trend will reverse either imminently or within a reasonable time frame? I think what will happen is that um, Nandini's point about incentives is right. The incentives uh, will change a bit the date, debate will continue, but I think one particularly important incentive is, is, is one that was um, uh, raised um, uh, by Jonathan, and that is the tax bias in favour of debt against equity is a real, really serious problem in the global economy. If you look at the huge overhang of, of, of debt in the non-financial corporate sector at the moment, um, that is deeply worrying, and there's is going to be the source of considerable trouble, and um, this bias also contributed to the great financial crisis. Um, having said all that, uh, my worry about the, the incentives is that um, the, the sort that if incentives are to be much laxer corporate governance, uh, I remain ambivalent and worried. <laughs> On that mixed point, can I thank John, can I thank Jonathan, Nandini, Angela and Adam, and of course all of you for watching. I fear this is something that will... And Andrew, before, Andrew, before we let you sign out, I think that this is going to be the last of these debates that you chair. No, one more this afternoon. On You've space. got one more. Because <laughs> I was, well then, if it's the second to last, I would still like to take the opportunity, if I may, on congratulating you on the fantastic job that you've done with the CSFI after so many years and we must have the opportunity to raise a drink to you and and the and and your your fantastic record there will be a handover party i hope uh, but M martina rightly wants to get her feet under the table first so it will be probably in three or four weeks uh, we'll have all right but it's all like to... congratulations to you well done andrew anyway like to join and yeah. indeed see you soon thank you